Hello, my name is Dr. Caitlin McGratton, and I'm a clinical researcher at Northwestern University. And today I'm going to be speaking about some work my colleagues and I have been conducting that has a central goal of developing standardized procedures to guide the execution and interpretation of the video fluoroscopic swallowing exam. Before I get started, I of course want to express gratitude to the support that has made this work possible, both the funding financially through uh, my mentorship of Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris has gratefully supported my research as well as um, some small startup grants in, of course, Northwestern. And of e potentially greater importance really are the clinical and research collaborations that have made this work possible. And certainly I'll be speaking about this today, but the work that I'm presenting is the result of a lot of great people working together. So I, of course, owe a ton of gratitude to my mentor, Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris. Heather McGee and Keely McKelvey are key members of the research team. They're the pediatric speech language pathologists that really collect all the data and not only that, help analyze it. They're amazing team members at Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Clarice Clemens is an otolaryngologist in pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina, and she's been a great collaborator as well. Dr. Leftengrief at Johns Hopkins University has been wonderful, and I'll be presenting work that her and Dr. Martin Harris have been really leading in standardization as well. And then we have a wonderful undergraduate student, Akshar Thakar, who's been great and helped in one of these projects, Let It. So thank you to all of them. Let's just start out by reviewing what standard practice parameters are. Really, why are they important? Um, I know it's not necessarily the most exciting topic to think about, but it's really key in looking at how we're going to transform the state of, of patient care in really any realm of patient care, but specifically what we'll be talking about today is pediatric dysphagia. So standard practice parameters are evidence-based guidelines developed to assist practitioners in providing best patient care. And these are really a very common thing to have across healthcare providers, specifically when we'll be dealing with regularly is in radiology. And the reason is this, because we know that slight modifications in procedure correlates can have huge implications for radiation exposure, diagnostic validity, and reliability. These are so important that the American College of Radiology are really equivalent to ASHA. They've developed these practice parameters for any given radiographic procedure. And within these documents, there are parameters that indicate competencies that their physicians should have prior to performing this procedure, indications that warrant the procedure, specifications on how to conduct it, and specifications on how to interpret it. So these are a very powerful tool and help to guide the physicians in all of their exams. A very important distinction to appreciate and that they mention and is key in interpreting all of the future work that I'll be talking about in this lecture is this statement that they make. They say the ultimate judgment regarding the propriety of any specific procedure or course of action must be made by the practitioner in light of the circumstances presented. And I think this is absolutely key. There are guidelines that will tell us how to perform things for the majority of patients, and that's great. We want to standardize things. We want to improve care. But as you all know, patients are very complex. Patients are unique. And this requires clinicians to have the ability to adapt the procedure as clinically indicated. And this is very, very important. So across all of these uh, studies that we've been doing, it's really important to note that these are the base guidelines and certainly times arise when you have to depart from that. And that's okay. Now, despite this great work that ACR's parameters have in many of their procedures for different things, they really don't have a ton guiding the execution of swallow studies, which is probably no surprise to you. And that's because until recently, there hasn't been much research from which they could draw to really develop strong standards for the exam. So in reviewing it, you see there's really minimal information on how the procedures should be conducted. The paucity of these standards, as you know, results in high variability in swallow study execution across the board. Um, specifically, we'll be talking today about infants that are bottle fed. 
This causes reduced diagnostic validity, so we don't always identify a deficit if it exists because of this variability. It may be um, non-standardized, not evidence-based methods of conducting the procedure. It causes reduced diagnostic reliability. So findings from my exam may differ from my colleagues because we did the exam in a completely different way. Reduced translatable yield. So difficulties in um, taking those findings from the SWAL study and making clinical recommendations that are not using barium and all sorts of things like that because it was done in, in such a variable way. It causes uh, reduced radiation or increased, pardon me, radiation exposure. And this is in large part, we've been finding that there's unclear endpoints to the exam. So if a clinician, especially a new clinician, is not well trained in how to complete the exam, then they often takes them longer processing time to interpret what's happening in real time. They tend to have longer radiation exposure times for the babies because they don't know when they have to stop. They're waiting to see the episode of aspiration, which we know that's not the purpose of the exam, and that's definitely not how we should be doing the exam, is just waiting until the child fails. That's not the goal. And then lastly, and huge, huge, um, is the difficulties in communicating about patients between clinicians. And so even now as we're getting better, it's still very hard as anyone who does these two, if my colleague does a swallow study, and there's no standards for how they conducted the exam or how they interpret the exam and report on the exam, it makes it very difficult to have an idea in your head of the impairments that patient had. I can't visualize it. Um, and so it historically has required clinicians to either go back and actually view the exam, which is time intensive and often difficult if the patient's at another location after the procedure to get those records, but um, also just Unfortunately, what often happens is because the clinicians can't interpret what happened in another place, they often will repeat the exam, and certainly we don't want that for our infants and have increased radiation exposure through that. So that's really where the work um, my colleagues and I come in, and that's really what we're trying to do is develop evidence so that we can start to create these evidence-based guidelines for the execution of the video fluoroscopic swallow study in bottle-fed infants. Before we delve into some of the research regarding these parameters, it's really important to take a step back and examine what the SWALLOW study is, because understanding the purposes of the SWALLOW study is really imperative to understanding the power of some of the findings that I'll be presenting. So just to begin, so we're all on the same page, of course, we all know the video fluoroscopic SWALLOW study is a video radiographic examination of SWALLOW function, and it uses barium contrast to evaluate three main things. Okay. The first of these is timing and integrity of oral pharyngeal swallow physiology. So does the patient have a delayed initiation of pharyngeal swallow? Do they have incomplete um, laryngeal elevation? All of these things that could be posing a barrier to the infant's ability to feed. We also do the exam to look at the effect of these physiologic processes on bolus flow. So maybe the infant has a delayed initiation of pharyngeal swallow as well as reduced hyolaryngeal elevation and excursion, and this results in aspiration. We know that aspiration is the result of a physiologic impairment. So simply identifying aspiration isn't getting us very far, if that's the purpose for us doing the exam, it's not getting us very far in identifying effective treatments or ways to rehabilitate that problem. And then the last one is to identify the therapeutic effect of targeted dysphagia regimens. So we identify these problems and we don't just end the exam at that. We then want to test the effect of interventions that can improve it. And we don't have to test, as we'll be discussing further, every single potential um, that causes unnecessary increased radiation exposure. What we want to be doing is testing these concepts, these mechanisms to see how the infant responds is, and then translate that response to how we can apply that clinical practice. As I mentioned, I think a mindset people get into during the swallow study across pediatrics and adults is to identify, to, they do it to identify if the patient is aspirating. So they, wanna, they want to be able to answer the question, is the patient aspirating their milk while they're drinking maybe in the NICU bedside out of their typically used hospital bottle? Maybe that's the question. And if we go into the exam with this goal, we are not only setting up 
ourselves up for failure because these variables, all three of these, are going to be different during the procedure. But more importantly, we're missing the two huge purposes of the exam, swallowing physiology and therapeutic effect. So yes, airway entry is important, but that's not necessarily the primary thing I'm looking for in the exams. We know we're just capturing a moment in time and we have to make bigger conclusions based on how the infant will be doing at bedside from that moment in time. So in this lecture, we'll be reviewing some research that shows how to best achieve these goals, how to achieve these three goals of the SWALLOW study, and we'll be primarily focusing on standardiz of standardization of the procedure. So I'll briefly be reviewing the standardized contrast that we used, um, and then really spending the majority of the time talking about the work that we've done standardizing the bottle and the times of video fluoroscopic visualization. And then I'll end by briefly reviewing the work that I've had the opportunity to collaborate on under the leadership of Dr. Bonnie Martin-Harris and Lefton Greif, which develops a standardized method of analyzing the pediatric swallow study exam. So let's start by first reviewing bearing. So to start, video fluoroscopic evaluation of the effects of oral pharyngeal swallow physiology on bolus flow requires the infant to consume barium, uh, which all of us are likely aware. And this has unique physical and chemical properties from infant formula and breast milk. I think we all appreciate this, but we probably don't take time to actually just sit and think about it for long regularly. So we know that even the best barium is going to be slightly different in viscosity than that infant's formula or breast milk. We know that it'll be different in density, in yield stretch, in temperature, in taste, and pH. All of these properties can change swallowing physiology to some degree. All of these properties can change response to aspiration to some degree. Um, animal research indicates pH is a huge variable in the response to aspiration, so whether an infant coughs or if they have desaturation or like not. So these variables make trying to use recipes of barium powder and thickening agents to achieve the exact same type of liquid and test response really, if nothing else, futile. And this is because you will not get the exact same in all of these, first of all, and also that uh, it's completely not practical. So if you're going to try to match every single formula, we know how many different formulas there are and we know that it can change for any given infant at the drop of a dime. Same for breast milk, that's going to change from one feed to another based on what the mother has eaten, their stress, and all of these other variables. So if we're trying to make the barium exactly reflect these things, we're going to be failing to start because it's not one, not clinically practical to do this each swallow study, but also we can't change all of these factors. Another limiting factor of mixing these own little um, recipes, while clearly is a great intention, another limiting factor is you're diluting the barium. We already know that identifying um, aspiration and penetration in infants is harder. The research that Dr. Martin Harris and Lefton Greif have led had shows this, that the reliability on actually the penetration aspiration scores were the low, lowest or some of the lowest of all of the physiologic measures. And this is because you're looking at such a small amount of liquid that is going into the airway. And even the smallest amount can create significant symptoms, but sometimes that's hard to view on video fluoroscopy. The more we dilute these, so say we're trying to make barium equivalent in viscosity to breast milk, the harder it's going to be to see that because you have the reduced opacity. So again, you're limiting the diagnostic yield from the exam. By using standardized barium contrast, however, such as varibarthin and nectar barium, these are the contrasts that we use. Um, they come with standard uh, thickening. So for the, the thin, you add water to a set amount, and this is standard across every time you make it. And then the nectar, and if you did need honey, are um, already pre-made and they're a standard viscosity. By using these, we know that we're at least holding our testing conditions constant allowing us to compare from one exam to another, whether done at the same hospital or an outside institution. So that uh, deficit, we can say at time one, if we do a repeat, we can see it's improved or not. 
The next thing we'll be talking about is the bottle. I'm going to spend a little bit more time speaking about that and really the research we've done in this area. As I mentioned before, the goal of the SWAL study is not just to identify impairments, but also to evaluate the effect of therapeutic interventions that are targeting these deficits. Two of the most common interventions that we're using are modification to bolus viscosity, which we test by providing thickened liquids, such as nectar barium, and liquid flow rate, which we test by providing a nipple with a smaller or larger orifice size that increases or decreases the flow. At the Medical University of South Carolina, where I, I did all of my training, like most institutions, we use to complete our SWAL studies using the hospital single-use bottle nipples or the infant's home bottle system if that's what the family brought in, and that was really our standard practice. And then in looking into the literature a little bit more, we took a step back and we realized that this practice really didn't make sense for a number of reasons. First is that the literature demonstrated that the hospital single-use bottle nipples did not provide a reliable reduction to flow rate. So there's been a number of studies dating back to the late 80s, but continuing now, um, Britt Pato's just recently did one showing that there is high variability in these single-use bottle nipples. So it's really providing an un potentially unintended restriction to flow. Um, for example, during the swallow study at 8 o'clock, you may pull out a standard hospital nipple. And then at the 9 o'clock swallow study, you pull out another standard hospital nipple. Well, because those two orifice sizes are likely different due to the vari variability in manufacturing process between them, you might be providing an unintended restriction to flow in the second one, and it's making it look like the child may have deficits in sucking physiology that requires them to suck five times to express the same bolus as the baby did before. So inaccurately identifying an impairment, or likewise, in the opposite direction, you could be showing that they don't have an impairment, um, say in the pharyngeal com physiologic component. So if you're restricting that flow, potentially you're making it so that um, you're providing a compensatory strategy and it looks like their swallowing physiology is overall very good. And in fact, if it wasn't restricted, it wouldn't be. So that's really the main reason why um, the uh, single-use bottle nipples just didn't make sense on our standpoint. And then the second reason is that there's a limited number of nipples that alter graduated flow options. So we really couldn't have a systematic way that specifically tests viscosity and flow rate therapeutic effect separately. This is because if attempting to test the effect of nectar liquids, but you use the same bottle nipple that you use for testing thin liquids, as you know, you're not only testing the effect of nectar, but you're also testing the effect of restricted milk flow rate. Um, so reduced flow rate, so not one in isolation, but really the cumulative effect of both at one time, because we know that getting a thicker liquid out of the same orifice size is going to restrict how much can come out. So my colleagues and I decided that not only did it make sense to standardize the bottle and nipple that we use within the exam, after all we standardized this for the adult side, but why wouldn't we just do this for pediatrics? And it certainly wasn't a fluid course. There was many reasons we thought, well, you know, the parents have what they're using at home and the hospital, they use this clinically. So why? Well, it comes down to all of these children are being referred to us for swallowing impairments. And so the chances that we're going to send them out and keep them on their home bottle system is slim to none, very likely. But also um, because of the fact that we know that even if we're trying to replicate the scenario that they're having impairments on, Again, because the barium is going to be slightly different, we're not necessarily even achieving that. Um, so it went into this study to identify two main things. Um, what nipple should we be using for thin liquid presentations? And what nipple should we be using for nectar liquid presentations? We ended up, after reviewing the different options for bottles that we could use, we selected the Dr. Brown's feeding system due to its commercial availability for parents, which eases translation of findings to home, the reliability shown by Britt Pados in flow rates across the nipples, which was huge, and of greatest importance was the wide array of flow rates available from their bottle nipples. So if we needed to increase flow to test that effect, we have multiple graduated options that we can do that um, instead of just one or sometimes no other option. 
In trying to decide these nipples, we realized that there were no literature to indicate what nipples would allow thin and nectar liquids to be expressed with the milk flow rates that infants expressed formula from a level one. So we started with a level one nipple as our baseline comparative group um, because we were trying to identify what the standard nipple should be for a typical, otherwise typical term infant that is feeding those babies that are referred um, from home due to recurrent respiratory infections and such. Um, and de determine what flow rates we would need for thin and nectar liquids to achieve the same flow rates that that baby could achieve from a level one when drinking formula at home, what would be an efficient flow rate. And therefore, these are the two aims that we investigated. To identify nipple enables thin barium contrast to be expressed at the same rate as formula using the level one nipple in the home environment, and also identify the nipple that enables nectar barium contrast to be expressed as the same rate of formula from the level one. So here you see the results. This is looking at flow rates of formula and thin barium contrast. Here you have formula indicated in the gold bar. So this is the flow rate of formula from a level one nipple. And the blue bars are indicating the flow rates of thin barium from the varying nipples. And we examined how the flow rate of formula from a level one compared to the flow rate of thin barium from the level one we found no significant difference in flow rate, indicating that while barium has unique properties, that any potential difference in viscosity was not great enough to reduce flow rate further on the video fluoroscopic swallowing exam. The difference in flow rates of formula from nectar barium contrast using the different nipples. So again, in the gold bar, you have the flow rate of formula from the level one. This is the same flow rate we saw on the last slide. And when we compared it to nectar barium using a level one, we found a significant difference. Nectar barium was significantly slower out of a level one than formula, which is what we all clinically appreciate and would make sense from a physics standpoint if you try to express barium that is thicker than formula out of the same bottom nipple using the same pressures, it will come out at a slower rate. And in fact, this just confirmed it. And when we tested the difference between formula and level two, we actually found that this was still significantly slower than formula from the level one. But when we looked at the comparison between nectar barium expressed from a level three compared to formula on the level one, we found that there was no significant difference. So that nectar three, the nectar barium from the level three indicating would be the nipple that you would want to provide as a comparative to test the effect of nectar barium contrast in isolation. In other words, using a nectar barium with level two or a nectar barium with level one isn't just testing the effect of nectar barium, the effect of nectar liquids, you're testing the effect of nectar liquids and reduced flow rate. So the main conclusions from this were that standardization of bottle nipple for thin and nectar barium contrast provisions is necessary to improve diagnostic validity, reliability, and evaluate treatment effect. Infants appropriate to initiate the exam on a Dr. Brown's level one bottle nipple, such as a, ter a term child that's appropriate to be drinking out of a level one, should be provided nectar liquids via Dr. Brown level three nipple when testing the effect of nectar liquids. Future investigations testing flow rate equivalents of premium nipples are warranted to refine the procedure guidelines. And so the way we envision this is having a, an algorithm for procedures so that if a baby based on their um, age and their diagnosis disease state may be you know, current clinical indications such as post-surgical interventions such as we see with heart babies, their cardiac defects, those infants would fall into one group um, that would follow a certain protocol starting with a standard nipple and for thin and then progressing to a different one for nectar and then those infants into another group maybe those that are older or uh, not medically fragile would go into another group that potentially would start with a Dr. Brown level one and progress to a level three for nectar liquids. The next component that I'll be talking about is standardizing video fluoroscopic visualization during the exam. So really the back part, this is the background behind the study um, is twofold. So this really came under the appreciation that we know that the SWALA study as we've been discussing is considered by many as the gold standard 
among instrumental swallowing assessments. And this is because it allows us to have this uninterrupted visualization of how these structural movements affect bolus flow. However, we know, unfortunately, that this visualization exposes infants to harmful ionizing radiations, and therefore clinicians must make determinations about deficits based on a sample of fluoroscopically observed swallows. We certainly do not leave fluoroscopy on for the entire bottle feed or even a small fraction of that. We have to just take a small sample and make a conclusion about the whole based on that. And although identifying impairment based on a sample of visualized swallows is valid if swallow function remains stable throughout the exam, clinical evidence suggests that feeding performance changes throughout the course of a bottle feed. And these graphs are just showing the, tr the basic trends, certainly um, not exact outcomes, but we can see the literature indicates that sucking rate, swallowing rate, sucks per swallow, and sucking amplitude all decline throughout a bottle feed. This is in clinical investigations. This hasn't been under a video fluoroscopic um, examination. And so if physiologic changes also occur in the integrity of oral pharyngeal swallow physiology, the timing that swallows are fluoroscopically sampled has the potential to greatly influence the exam's diagnostic accuracy. So if I only look at the first five swallows of the exam and my colleague looks at swallows um, 20 minutes into the exam, it has the potential that we would find very different things. And that's not necessarily what we want in a diagnostic exam. So the aim of this pilot investigation was to identify the stability of oral pharyngeal swallow physiology and airway protection throughout the video fluoroscopic exam to really start just a pilot to guide us on what some of the time points that we might want to say are our standard time points of evaluation. And this, I must add, is not necessarily just um, a study that is helpful for clinical purposes, which uh, we have found it to be, but also was um, really started as a result of trying to test the effect of interventions in fluoro. And we all appreciated that there was this change throughout the exam, but we didn't know exactly when and how. And as you can imagine, if you're trying to test the effect of one intervention against another with an exam, if you test the second intervention at the end of the exam every time, it might be effective, but it might not show it is because that reduction in function is overcoming it. So we are trying to really clarify this as well for research purposes, so twofold um, aims. So to do this, we developed a video fluoroscopic swallow study procedure, and this included the fluoroscopic visualization of five thin liquid swallows at four standard time points. So we watched five swallows, the first five swallows of the exam. We then turned off fluoroscopy and then watched five swallows at 30 seconds, one minute, 30 seconds, and two minutes and 30 seconds. Throughout this time, there were no attempts to provide compensatory interventions or remove the bottle from the oral cavity because again, we wanna test what the infant's function is and then apply interventions as necessary. The first time points, I'll add the 30 seconds time points was based on the previous reports of these changes in respiration, sucking and swallowing from clinical examinations, indicating that that initial suck burst could last 15, up to 15 to 30 seconds, and then there was a reduction in all of these values. So that's how we developed that 30 second mark. One minute and 30 seconds and two minute and 30 seconds were determined based on the desire to see a potential change in function, but also keep it, keep it within clinically relevant time. So certainly we could have made this much greater. We could have extended it to 20 minutes in the exam, but we didn't want the baby to be drinking that much barium. That would not be good for the infant. And um, just under the appreciation that under typical clinical restraints, um, fluoroscopy rooms are not allowing us to be in there for 20 minutes to let the baby continue to um, feed so we can look at this change in true clinical practice. So these are the time points that we started with. Here's just a quick example. So you can see these are the first five swallows. Here's 30 seconds. This is one minute and 30 seconds. And two minutes and 30 seconds. So again, throughout this whole time, the baby was feeding, but we would only turn on fluoro to watch five swallows at each of those times. 
Once the data had been collected, we excluded those infants who could not um, participate for the beyond the first 30 seconds. So a baby had to be able to continue eating for throughout the first one minute and 30 seconds to be included in this investigation. For example, a baby with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, status post their stage one palliative repair, oftentimes um, would not maintain a latch for those first 30 seconds. And therefore, we did not include them in this investigation because we want to see the potential for this thing that we refer to as fatigue, although that has huge implications for the source of it, but to determine for that baby who's actively feeding and we see a reduction in function over time. For those infants that were included, we went chart review for a review of demographics, the primary diagnosis and swallow study indication. And then the swallow studies were scored frame by frame by two speech language pathologists with greater than or equal to 80% reliability in scaring characteristics of swallow physiology and bolus flow. And these are select components from Dr. Martin Harris and Dr. Lefton Graves project that I'll be briefly discussing later that discusses a standardized metric for analyzing the swallow study exam. So we looked at number of sucks per swallow, oral bolus containment prior to swallow, bolus location at initiation of swallow, timing that the swallow initiated, so once the bolus, say, reached uh, that point of initiation, if it was the piriform sinuses, say, the amount of time it resided there prior to when the baby swallowed, and bolus airway entry, which we looked at penetration or an aspiration. Differences in swallowing attributes between time points were tested using student t-test and Rouse-Scott chi-square tests with clustering to account for multiple data points within subjects. Here you can just see our sample, and I'm not going to delve into it too much for this lecture, but the average postmenstrual age of the infants at evaluation was 55.7 weeks. Our sample size was 30 for this initial investigation so that we could power a much larger investigation that's currently underway. And here you can see the different indications for the swallow studies. So babies were categorized based on the primary indication that justified the swallow studies. The majority of them were re referred for a swallow study due to coughing and choking in feeds, um, followed by chronic respiratory morbidity, insufficient milk ingestion, follow-up from previously documented impairment, cardiopulmonary compromise with feeds, fussiness with feeds, and post-surgical swallowing risk. And here are our results. So we found that there was a significant reduction in swallowing physiology from the first five swallows to those at 30 seconds and to those at one minute and 30 seconds in all of the outcomes. We found no significant change in swallow physiology between one minute and 30 seconds and two minute and 30 seconds in any of the outcomes. So let's start with number of sucks per swallow. As you can see here, the mean number of sucks per swallow significantly increased throughout these first time points. Oral bolus hold significantly reduced in function, so the percent of swallows that had bolus escaped the pharynx prior to the initiation of the pharyngeal swallow increased from about 40% in the first 40% of swallows showing this impairment in the first five swallows to about 90% of swallows at one minute and 30 seconds. When we looked at the change in initiation of pharyngeal swallow, so where the bolus was when the swallow actually occurred, we found a significant increase again throughout the first three time points, starting at about 37% at the first five swallows with a delay of initiation of pharyngeal swallow below the level of the vollecula, increasing to 75% at one minute and 30 seconds, showing this delay to this level. The timing of initiation of pharyngeal swallow also showed a significant increase in time. So during the first five swallows, on average, it was zero. So the swallow initiated immediately wherever it was located. And by one minute and 30 seconds, it had about 275 millisecond delay from the time it reached that location of initiation to when the swallow initiated. And lastly, we found a significant change in bolus airway entry, so the percent of swallows with penetration or aspiration. 
we actually found no significant differences between 0 and 30 seconds, but we found a significant difference between 30 seconds and 1 minute and 30 seconds in the exam, increasing from about 40% of swallows showing penetration or aspiration within those five swallows at 30 seconds to about 65% at 1 minute and 30 seconds into the exam. Again, despite these um, non-significant findings in especially 0 to 30, you can see a, certainly an upward trend in, in most of these outcomes, even if those significant, those values weren't significant, there was an upward trend. So our main conclusions from this investigation are that oral pharyngeal swallow physiology exhibits temporal changes throughout the video fluoroscopic swallowing exam. The timing that swallows are fluoroscopically visualized may impact diagnostic validity and that future investigation examining the underlying mechanisms responsible for these changes are necessary to identify targets for swallowing interventions. One of the key things um, we're looking to do um, right now, we currently have a sample of 130 infants who've undergone this protocol, all with their diagnostic category and disease states um, recorded, is to identify if um, that two minute and 30 second time point is necessary. As you notice, none of the there was no significant difference between one minute and thirty seconds and two minute thirty seconds in this data. All there were upward trends in um, all of those outcomes. Um, one of our questions is if that fact that there's no significant difference was a result of a smaller sample size in that group. So that group had fewer infants due to the fact that some infants, if they exhibited such significant deficits um, up until 1 minute and 30 seconds of the exam, it was clinically indicated that a compensatory intervention had to be applied. And so therefore, um, we limited that group potentially to the children that were doing better, or it just had a smaller sample so it was lower power and we couldn't detect a significant difference. So in the next investigation that we're currently doing, um, we're controlling for that so we can identify if that time point is necessary. While concurrently looking at why, um, why is this change happening? And um, to potentially guide us in developing new interventions that can help prevent this change or treat it once it occurs. So the last thing that I'll be speaking about today is the standardization of the analysis, the interpretation of the video fluoroscopic swallowing exam. And again, I cannot take credit for this in any way. This is Dr. Martin Harris and Dr. Leftengrave's grant that they received an R01 to develop this tool. And I was um, fortunate enough to have the privilege to work on this. This grant started um, when I first started my PhD. So I was granted this awesome opportunity to work on it throughout my PhD and have continued involvement with it to date. So it's been done under great leadership for sure. So here you can see, for those of you, many of you know um, the MBSIMP, and for those of you who do not know the MBSIMP, Dr. Martin Harris developed the MBSIMP. I think she published her first paper on it in 2008, and this tool arose out of a huge clinical need. So um, Dr. Martin Harris is a clinical researcher like myself, and she practiced as a clinician prior to getting her PhD, and she realized very early on that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's there weren't standardized ways to interpret a swallow study and people were providing patients with all sorts of different materials during the exam. And therefore, when she had a patient that underwent one, it, it wasn't very helpful to look at the report if she got one at all because she couldn't really make much sense of it. So, you know, early in her career, she developed this, this grant um, that turned into something much bigger than I think she ever expected it to be. And that is a standardized way of analyzing the exam for after it's completed. So looking at the different physiologic processes that contribute to a swallow and rating each of those processes. But as part of this, she also appreciated, and I now have a strong appreciation for as well, that um, anyone can create the standardized metric that looks at different swallowing components. So maybe looking at tongue base retraction or pharyngeal stripping wave or PES opening. Anyone can create a, a tool that has these components and creates ways to describe them and use that for clinical practice, certainly. The real tricky thing is developing a tool that can be reliably done. So that if I score a, uh, a two on tongue base retraction, um, you know exactly what that means because 
uh, we have both been trained in the definition of what a two means. And so as part of this tool, she completed very rigorous testing. It started out as this much larger um, analysis metric with much more different descriptors. But throughout years of testing, she found that clinicians couldn't differentiate between some different components. So just slight differences in physiology, they could not reliably differentiate between those. And therefore, these components were collapsed into those that were found to be able to be reliably differentiated between with 80% reliability. So in her final tool, this is the pediatric um, mock-up, but if for those of you who've done the MDSIMP, you know, she has an online training portal where you can undergo training in how to score using this approach, and then um, you have access to this amazing online report generating tool that can be used. For those clinicians who do swallow studies in pediatrics and haven't undergone the MBSIMP training, I would highly recommend it. Um, certainly, I appreciate that some of these components are going to be different um, in the pediatric model that I'll be talking about now, um, but it the basic fundamentals are the same, and as we know, if you're in pediatrics, you're not just dealing with bottle-fed infants, you're also dealing with older children that much more similarly are consistent with the adult model than the infant model. So that is something I would strongly recommend. All of that being said, as I said before, when I first started my PhD, Dr. Martin Harris and Dr. Lefton Greif had just been granted this uh, large grant from the National Institute of Health, and it's called the Standardization of the Video Forescopic Swallow Studies for Bottle-Fed Children. And the goal was to translate uh, the work that she had done in the adult population to a tool that could be used for bottle-fed infants due to this clear need. And so we just actually published the first paper on this tool after years. Again, I started this the first year of my PhD, and we just published this this year. So it gives you an idea of how long this process takes, but we are actually getting very close to having the final product done. So we're excited. And so really, in this manuscript, this whole process is outlined, and I'm going to simplify it a bit for discussion purposes here. But this all started with the prototype tool development, the framework of which was the MBS IMP, and included the physiologic components of swallow physiology as well as those score variants. So tongue-based retraction had different ways to categorize its function, as well as operational definitions for each of those. Um, and to make it so that clinicians ideally would be able to understand what each of those components is just by reading the definitions because certainly you need these operational definitions to be able to get reliability. This prototype tool was then disseminated to a multidisciplinary team of speech pathologists, ENTs, radiologists, neonatologists, pulmonologists to determine the importance of each component as well as the clarity of the definitions um, for this tool. Based on their feedback, this tool was further refined and um, ready for testing. So, as I mentioned, when the tool is completed, we then um, went on to clinical training for the use of the tool. This is one of the first steps was this, was creating this massive media library of fluoroscopic examples for each component score. So um, we had, I think at the time, we had 23 or, or near that. At one point, we had in the 20s of different physiologic components, and each, of, each one of those had between three and seven different scores that could be assigned depending on the component. So for each one of those scores, we needed to collect a number of different examples so that clinicians could be trained in how to score each of those score variants. We then gathered a group of seven speech pathologists. Actually, we intentionally gathered some that were actually all adult speech pathologists. They hadn't practiced in pediatrics and some that were in pediatrics for a six hour face-to-face -face training um, to tell them how to do this. They then underwent independent scoring practice where they could practice based on the training that they had and they had the opportunity to ask questions. And then we also had some individuals um, do refinement training sessions where they could achieve more training in how to score using this way. 
We used the questions that clinicians asked to further refine the score definitions. As the questions were gathered, we just refined these so that we could make sure that uh, going into testing to see if it could be done reliably, it was as good as it could be, as clear as it could be. And then we underwent reliability testing. And really, reliability testing and prototype tool refinement is a um, kind of a collaborative process, a reiterative process, because as we underwent reliability testing, based on feedback that clinicians were saying that certain component scores were tricking them or they were having difficulty, we would further refine the definitions to clarify some of the questions and aid in um, the reliability process. So um, when we did the actual reliability testing, though, um, we had we did this using 300 swallow studies. So when the project first started, um, we needed to collect 300 swallow studies of bottle-fed infants. This was split between MedU of South Carolina and Johns Hopkins University um, when they drank standardized thin and nectar varibarium contrast to make sure all of those fluoroscopic characteristics were constant between the two. Certainly, we know that different radiographic features can change your ability to reliably rate things. Um, I'll not go into it in this discussion, but we use standardized imaging platforms. So we use 30 frames or pulses per second, um, and we mapped to nine field of view um, for the real small neonates, and then as kids were getting older, um, to six. These swallow studies were de-identified and they were disseminated to clinicians for testing of their ability to reliably rate these components against the co-PI's gold standard scores that they had established. And so they started with 10 full-length exams and they were provided training for more scores as they were missed. Throughout multiple processes as outlined in this manuscript, we found that after three rounds of reliability scoring and training refinement, that all clinicians were able to achieve greater than or equal to 80% reliability in the analysis of all of these components. So with this reliable tool, that really leads us to the next step, which is um, certainly publishing it, like we're doing now, is showing the process um, and the scientific rigor that was involved in, in demonstrating that component, but then also uh, creating this online training manual, as you've seen for the adult MBS IMP, um, which is in the process of getting underway, but as you can imagine, it's quite an endeavor. So, um, so it's really exciting. We're excited for this tool to come out and to have Dr. Martin Harris and Lafton Greif speak more with you about um, the the stories and the science behind how this was developed. It's really a neat neat story, and it was a great honor to be part of. So, with that said, that really concludes uh, my talk for today. Um, if you want to sign up for our email registry to get updates on um, some of the research that we're doing, we have adult research going on, we have adult uh, pediatric pardon me, research going on, please contact us through our website, scsc.northwestern.edu. This stands for Swallowing Cross Systems Collaborative. It's the um, center that Dr. Martin Harris and I've started at Northwestern where we do dysphagia research really across the lifespan, trying to connect some of these adults between the pediatric and the adult mechanism and really improve clinical care that way. So if you go to that website, again, scsc.northwestern.edu, and you go to our Contact Us page, um, please feel free to put in your email. And if you um, want specific updates relevant to pediatrics or specific updates to adult or any updates at all, um, please just put that in the comments field and we will be sure to add you to those email lists. Um, also, something that is very exciting for us is um, for some of you you may have attended we have the charleston swallowing conference that dr martin harris started in charleston south carolina while she had her time of employment there and now that we are both at northwestern um, we decided it would be an awesome opportunity to have the conference move some from seaside to lakeside so we'll be holding the charleston swallowing conference at Northwestern University um, in this year and upcoming years. It'll be held July 12th through 14th, 2018. 
in Chicago, Illinois, the conference actually will take place on Northwestern's Evanston campus, which I think will be awesome. You'll be able to see the campus a bit and walk between, walk through the campus as you're getting to the different lectures. And we just finished the program this week. So we are really excited. Uh, we have group sessions that are designed to, dis to target dysphagia from those concepts that apply to both pediatric and adults. And then we also have breakout sessions where we can discuss specifics to each of those populations where we have, I think we were up to 50 really amazing dysphagia researchers. If you have read any dysphagia literature, um, most likely the speaker will be here at the conference. So we have a really impressive uh, lineup for you and I think you'll be really excited um, not to mention it's a beautiful time in Chicago and perfect to get away so you can also find more information about that on our website scse.northwestern.edu under the events tab and we will be posting more information on the specific program there's a spot that if you want us to provide you updates specific to the conference you can also do that there um, as well and, and tickets are currently on sale now so um, we thank you so much uh, for listening, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, again, my email is Caitlin, K-A-T-L-Y-N dot McGratton, M-C-G-R-A-T-T-A-N at Northwestern.edu. Thank you so much.